Hi, I'm Steve Selig, founder of Fit Test, and in a series of uh, videos I'm going to create on aortic stenosis for exercise professionals. In part one, which is this video, I'm going to just uh, give you a brief rundown of what is aortic stenosis and to uh, provide a, a relevant case study uh, to get started as an exercise professional with this very significant condition. So what is aortic stenosis? Stenosis means a narrowing or tightening. And basically what's happening here, you can see that there's some calcium deposit on the three leaflets of the aortic valve. Uh, looking at the valve, uh, this is the aortic valve with three. And that calcification means that the valve uh, has a great deal of trouble opening with insufficient opening aperture to actually produce enough stroke volume and enough cardiac output. Um, so the first thing that will happen is that the heart will have to generate a lot more pressure to produce the, the um, stroke volume and cardiac output through this narrowing. Uh, this is quite a um, dangerous condition at this level of severity and would need a medical intervention in order for the, to prevent quite a few things from happening. Uh, thing chronically in terms of heart failure, worsening heart failure would occur with this, but acutely there could be even the possibility of sudden cardiac death. And it's certainly on the contraindication list for exercise. So we as exercise professionals need to be very cautious uh, when we are exercising people with aortic stenosis preoperatively, of course. Um, it really comes down to the severity of the disease. And I'm going to show you the severity on this slide a bit later on. We can certainly work with mild and moderate disease, but we can't work with severe and critical disease. So this, it just shows you physiologically now what happens across the narrow valve. And if this is a pressure wave here and generated in the left ventricle, uh, that pressure is then dissipated. So what happens across the narrowing is we get a very fast jet of blood across the narrowing, but at lower pressure. And that lower pressure is going to interfere with obviously the pressures in the, uh, in, in the um, arterial system. And it's going to make it difficult for us to interpret what is going on in the heart because of this pressure drop. We're measuring in the, in the arm, for example, the brachial artery. But do we really know what is going on in the left ventricle, which is where the critical pressures are, are being generated? So we need to know that. There are disturbances to both flow in terms of fast jet but turbulent flow beyond the obstruction beyond the obstructed valve changes to pressure downstream or beyond the obstructed valve changes to pressure upstream in other words the left ventricle has to generate more pressure and this effectively becomes a problem for afterload uh, of the left ventricle i'll have a lot more to say about that as we go along so this is just to show what can happen to the pressures uh, when the pressure drops across the obstructed valve. And in this example, we've got pressure drops. This is the LV pressure. This is the aortic pressure shown here. Um, 138, 152, 150, 50, et cetera. Whereas these are 180s to 190s in, in the left ventricle. So just showing really illustrating the point I just made that we've got a very significant pressure drop and change to blood flow across the obstructed valve due to this calcification. In this example, the pressure drops are about 40 millimetres of mercury or just a fraction over 40 millimetres of mercury. And when I talk about the severity of disease in a minute, I'll come to that, uh, I'll come back to that point. So the point is though, that when you measure pressure in the brachial artery, that is not really telling you what is going on in the left ventricle, the critical pressures in the left ventricle whether the, and, and this could be both at rest and during exercise. So um, if the pressure drop such as this is about 40 or a little bit over 40 millimetres of mercury, it means whatever pressure you measure here, suppose you measured a pressure here of 140 systolic, we really need to add that 40 mil pressure drop across the valve to the 140 to really get an idea of what the pressure is doing in the left ventricle. And the example I've just given would be adding 40 mil of mercury to 140 measured in the brachial artery and end up with an estimated systolic 
blood pressure at that time of 180 millimetres of mercury, which is clearly very unsatisfactory and very unsafe. So we have to be very careful in applying the normal blood pressure rules for exercise based on brachial artery pressures when we have this huge pressure drop across the obstructed stenotic aortic valve. And this really also interplays into coronary artery blood flow that is sort of a different topic but related topic. So if the pressure, for example, I'll just give you another example here. Suppose we have uh, very, um, we have critical drop in pressure across the valve. So it might have been uh, 140 here, but maybe the, the pressure gradient across the valve was 50. That would make the, um, the, the pressure in the, um, in the uh, left ventricle 170 or 190. And if we had very low pressures occurring in the aortic arch due to a big drop in pressure across the stenotic valve, across the diseased valve, we could end up with actually low pressures in the supplying the coronary arteries. And this might make someone's coronary artery disease worse and tip them into angina simply because two things are happening. The left ventricle, which is not shown here, would be working too hard on systolic blood pressure to generate the pressures across the very stenotic or very diseased valve. And that would put up the work of the heart and the oxygen demand of the heart. But on the oxygen supply side of it, we could end up with actually low pressures in the aortic arch due to the big drop in pressure shown here across the aortic valve, resulting in low perfusion pressures of the heart itself. So we could end up with a double whammy, if you like, of increased oxygen demand because the left ventricle has to pump too hard to produce the pressure needed to overcome the obstruction, leading to a lowish pressure even in the aortic arch and low perfusion pressures in the coronaries, which would then impact on uh, oxygen supply to the heart by the FIC formula for the heart. And so we'd end up with a demand and supply problem, a negative a negative um, balance between uh, demand and supply leading to chest pain. So just finally, the severity of disease, mild disease, is indicated by um, aortic valve area of 1.2 to 1.8 centimetre squared. We're talking about the area here across the diseased aortic valve and the mean gradient of 12 to 25, referring to the gradient across here from 12 to 25 drop that is, this pressure is 12 to 25 millimetres of mercury greater than this pressure here in the aortic arch. That's the pressure drop there. So that's called mean uh, systolic blood pressure gradient across that diseased valve. So that's mild. Moderate is 0.8 to 1.2 centimetres squared. So we've got a, a more narrowing of the aortic uh, valve aperture. And the gradient has now gone up to 25 to 40. In severe disease, the aortic valve uh, area down to 0.6 to 0.8 centimetres squared. The mean gradient has gone up to 40 to 50 mil mercury. And critical, the aortic valve area is 0.6 to, point, uh, to less than 0.6 centimetres squared. The mean gradient above 50 millimetre, uh, um, millimetres of mercury. Now of these four classifications of severity of aortic stenosis, Mild and moderate uh, uh, can be can, can exercise, and so exercise professionals can certainly work effectively with people with mild and moderate disease, but you will need to adjust your brachial artery pressure calculations to take into account what the actual gradient is if it is known. Now, if it's not known, just assume the higher figure of 25. So suppose someone is just um, comes with a report of mild disease, then you can, and but without the gradient, then you can just assume the gradient is 25. So I'll just say that again. If someone presents with mild disease, but you don't know what the pressure gradient is, assume it is the upper number of 25 and add that to your brachial pressures. So for example, if brachial pressure was 140, we would add 25 and we'd then interpret left ventricular systolic pressure, in other words, left ventricular systolic pressure here, to be 140 plus 25 or 165. And we would do that at rest and we would also do that in exercise. Similarly for moderate disease, if we didn't know what the pressure gradient was, we would add the upper number of 40 
And in the example I've just given of brachial 140, we would effectively estimate the left ventricular systolic blood pressure to be 140 plus 40 equals 180. And we'd obviously have to take a lot of care with exercising someone with those sort of pressures. But you can exercise them, but you've got to be careful and you've got to make that adjustment for the mean systolic blood pressure gradient across the, uh, the diseased valve, in other words, left ventricular to aortic arch. In severe disease and critical disease, these are not candidates for exercise. They're on the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines for absolute contraindications to exercise. You could do a little bit of gentle walking with the severe. The critical are going to need to go to, uh, to intervention, such as surgery or uh, TAVI, valve replacement, using a catheter approach. So we now come to my case. 78-year-old uh, female with severe aortic stenosis, and we'll just go through that now, heavily calcified valve. This is not actually her uh, valve, but it's just indicating uh, her, um, just a, a picture of, of someone with severe aortic stenosis. Um, we have uh, then show similar pictures, uh, stenotic valve with a lot of thickening of the left ventricle to overcome the stenotic valve and the impact that that will have on coronary artery blood flow. Medications are tenolol. What a tenolol does as a beta blocker is it will reduce heart rate and reduce systolic blood pressure. It will reduce pressures in here. It will reduce pressures in the aorta. And in so doing, it will reduce the work of the heart on the rate pressure product, um, as well as some of the other laws of the heart. But the main law of the heart that comes in here at this point is the law of the heart of rate pressure product. We then come into the next drug, Urbisartan and hydrochlorothiazide, which is a poly drug of an angiotensin uh, receptor blocker with a thiazide diuretic. The thiazide diuretic will take people to the left on um, Starling and uh, also reduce um, the preload and in so doing reduce the work of the heart. Uh, reduced stroke volume through reducing preload. Herbicidin will reduce afterload by reducing the amount of peripheral vasoconstriction. Amlodipine is a calcium channel blocker, which is a heart relaxing drug as well as a coronary artery relaxing drug. So it'll improve coronary artery blood flow as, as will a tenolol, but it will also uh, uh, reduce the work of the heart in terms of its contractile activity. Anginine is needed in the case of angina uh, or chest pain. We've already explained why chest pain may arise with people with severe aortic stenosis due to the imbalance between O2 supply through the coronary arteries and O2 demand through the hypertrophy to left ventricle that is being asked to pump against a very severe, severely blocked um, heart valve. So the intervention that this uh, lady had was called TAVI, which is transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And she just had it recently. So this is a catheter approach because she was so sick, she couldn't undergo open chest surgery. So the TAVI procedure fortunately is available these days. And that is a balloon approach to putting in a new valve across the diseased valve and effectively opening up this obstruction. It won't reverse the hypertrophy very readily, but at least it will take the work off the heart. And now we come to exercise itself, which will be uh, contraindicated in this case until the person has had TAVI. Once the person's had TAVI, exercise is certainly not contraindicated and we can get on with exercise at that point. So thanks for listening to this video. And as always, you can contact me at info at myfittest.com.au.